Hello, and welcome to episode 39 of the Posecast with Rabbi Shmuel Posner, myself, Seth Hellman. Rabbi, how are you doing today? Oh, fine. Baruch Hashem. Yourself? Baruch Hashem. Oh, excellent. So right before we went on air, I said, Seth, are you ready for the Fabrengen? So let's start Fabrengen. We should call this the Posecast Fabrengen. So did you get the picture I sent you? Yes, I got the two pictures and the video. Ah, the video is for the end. The two pictures, I don't remember what both pictures are. Oh, the, I know. The first picture happened today. This is like hot news off the, off the press. So I was in the office today doing stuff, and I, heard, and, uh, I went out. I, got, I said, I got to get out. So I went down to campus, and I was sitting at the table doing, my, you know, just hanging out. You can see in the background, if anybody knows the GSU, you see the tables aren't there. They have couches, so I'm not sure what, what that what that's all about. So I was sitting at the round tables that are there, and this guy walks by. He's wearing a hat and a jacket, a coat, and he walks by me and he says, "Are you a rabbi?" I said, "Yeah, I'm a rabbi." <laughs> and we started chatting a little bit. And he, he says he's Jewish, and I said, um, did, you, "Did you put on? You have to fill in." He said, "I have. I haven't put on fill in." I said, "You want to put on fill in now?" And he said, "Yeah." And he said he hadn't done it for a long time, and he was very, very happy. And then he says to me, can I take a picture? And I'm like, yeah, I'm into pictures. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I said, yeah, sure. I said, what are you going to do? I said, take a picture and spread it around to anybody you know. He said, I have four brothers. And oh. so after, after he, 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 he put on fill-in, he's like laughing as he's sending it to his brothers, you know, telling them they should put on fill-in too. And, um, and that was it. I, I, had, I, I was here for a little while, and this is, this is the reason I went there. And the reason I tell you this story is, oh, it's not such a big deal, whatever. It's a huge deal. You know why? Because of Ashgacha protest. The guy was there because he's part of the painter's union. He was painting. I don't know what he was painting. I didn't ask. Somewhere in the GSU, he was painting. And the fact that I came there exactly that moment that I was sitting there, if we were sitting at the table, he wanted to pass by so close so Hashem like spent a lot of time, quote unquote, orchestrating that this should happen. And I, I could always, you, you could always imagine Hashem like holding his breath. Is he going to ask him to put on film? Is he going to put on film? Boom, it happened. Baruch Hashem, amazing. I don't, and then I, and then I felt like I got to do something more with this guy. So I said to him, do you have a mezuzah on your door? He said, yeah, I have a mezuzah on my front door and my back door. Because I had a mezuzah, I was going to give him a mezuzah. I just wanted to, I wanted to push the mitzvah a little further. So, um, Baruch Hashem, that was the Hashgacha Pratis. And that's a great gift that we have, that when we have the right intention, sometimes it doesn't work out. You know, sometimes you have intentions and it'll work out. Which reminds me of a story with my father. He should be well, live long. So, I was then um, 13 years old. Maybe, yeah, 13 years old. We lived in Bar Park then, and I had a little problem with, with my foot. Not a big deal, but, you know, something that had to be taken care of by a doctor. So the doctor's office was actually in Flatbush, a few blocks away from Labab Yeshiva, where I was in Yeshiva. But, his fa- but he, he lived with his father about a block, two blocks from our house in Bar Park. So I went, I went to his house because he, I needed the treatment, you know, that day or something. I went to his house. And uh, he treated me. And then I said to him, do you want to put on tefillin? And he said, no. And I was like, just bar mitzvah then. So I came back home. I was devastated. I asked the guy to put on tefillin. Do you want to put on tefillin? (laughs) So my father said, told me a story that he once, years before, I think it may have been before the Rebbe was Rebbe, that he was... There was somebody that needed to be contacted. I think the Rebbe sent my father go talk to this fellow. And uh, then he asked the Rebbe advice how to talk to him. And it ended up that the guy didn't become Shemir Tehran Mitzvahs. So my father said, you see, even with the advice of direct guidance of the Rebbe, sometimes it doesn't work out. So you never know. You know, It's not to say that it was a waste of time or something. You don't see the tangible results. So sometimes Hashem is kind enough to us that we can actually see the tangible results. Sometimes you say, what, are we, what am I doing here? What was the whole point? But then you find out that there is a point. Which brings me to another story, which happened on Sunday. 
So Monday night, there was a Monday night there was a wedding in New York, right? And this is a fellow that I met probably not more than six months ago. He lives here in Brook, and he actually grew up in in Brookline, Brighton. He still lives there. He joined our Wednesday night Hasidus class, which you can find online. Well, you can't find it online. You have to find it on the WhatsApp. But we have a Wednesday. You're on the you're on the group, aren't you? The yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, the Wednesday night. So we learned Chassidus. So he started coming, learning Chassidus. Okay. Then I, he was getting ready for his wedding. So I studied some. I helped him with the laws of, getting, of marriage and all that kind of stuff. And he invited me to the wedding. And it's Monday night. And I, I just come back from Chicago. Last week I was in Chicago for a wedding on... Wednesday. Wednesday night. How do you know? Oh, because we, we, we recorded earlier in the week. Wednesday night. So I was like, I, I don't want to drive to New York and drive back. I don't want to do this. Uh. And then, so on Sunday, I said to my wife, to Hani, I said, you know, that's it. I'm not going. I'm not going. Because if I'm, I'm planning to drive on Sunday, sleep overnight in my brother's house, if he gives me permission, he usually does, sleep over there Sunday night, and then come back, and then be there for the wedding, and drive back at night Monday night, which, oh, I hate driving at night. Or... Be there, go on Monday and drive back on Tuesday. I mean, to, uh, I don't want to do that either. So, but then I, I felt like, you know, I told him specifically I was going to come. I don't, I don't like breaking my word. So I'm thinking I should go. Uh, so finally, I said, you know what? If I could find somebody in New York, one of the alumni that I can meet with him or her, then I'll go to New York and that'll be, make, it, make the trip worthwhile. Even if I have to go on Monday and come back Monday, on Tuesday, I'll do that. So I contacted my friend Morad, Morad, R-E-A, and I said, hey, I'm coming to New York. Want to meet up? And I, I, he said, where? I said, come to Crown Heights. He said, he agreed to come to Crown Heights. So we met in Crown Heights. And the thing was, so I said, okay, so I gave him a little tour. We went, we, we did, we looked at 770 and uh, went through 770. Then we went to the communication room where, where there's that small room where the Rebbe's message was broadcast around the world in technology that was not at all normal in those days. If you've been there, you know what I'm talking about. If not, I'll show you what it is. And then we, we went down. We went, um, I said, you know, I, need an, I didn't eat yet today because I went to the aisle before. So I walk, we walked down Kingston Avenue to this little pizza shop be, between Crown and Montgomery. A little like a dinky place, a very, not, not dinky, very simple place. It's a pizza shop. And went in, and he ordered a slice of pizza. I ordered some salad with tuna fish. We sat down to eat and we talked and we had a power hour. If you, were, if you saw this, the post on Instagram, it was called a power hour. And um, we spoke, we fabrained, and good things came out of it. More things are going to come out of that. And then as I'm sitting there, okay, that was it. You know, there weren't many customers there. That's me. Do you know who R-A-K is or something? Anyway, R-A-K? It was some guy. It doesn't matter. It's not Irish guy. Somebody sent me a message because he looks like somebody. And anyway, this is the place. I'm the thing. So there we are having a little fun bringing. And then when I come home, my wife says to me, Shoshana, who's in California, wants to know why I didn't tell her that I'm going to Crown Heights. I'm like, well, what do you mean? I got to report my whole life. <laughs> First of all, last minute decision. Second of all, whatever. And then my wife says to Shoshana, how did you know he's in Crown Heights? In the pizza shop. She said, my friend was eating pizza. In the, and I know there was actually, I, I saw a, a couple of girls, two girls sat down. At the, whatever, I paid no attention to them. I was busy talking to Morad. But they were like the only co- other customers there, sitting there. So there you go. Hashem runs the world. I'm, I... I it, and he himself was like, we're eating in this place. All these great eateries in Crown Heights, we're eating in this place? Because it's very simple. I said, yeah, dafka this place. Because we don't need a, I don't want a fancy place. It's distracting. I don't want fancy food. It's a stomachache. This is perfect. So that was another hashgacha protest right there. Boom, boom, boom. Then I went to the wedding. And I knew, I, I heard about the, the Kalos family, but I, I, didn't, I didn't connect it. Then the father comes over to me in the middle of the wedding. He says, you know, my daughter, what do you say? My daughter was in the Chabad house or something, and I didn't hit me. That's right. I remembered because his daughter's name was Hannah. I said, mm. right, right. And then, and then I, afterwards, after he left, I looked at my emails, and there's a whole series of emails we had. She had come for a summer program at Simmons College, 
and they were very concerned about kosher food. And every every Shabbos that summer, she came over. It was in 2011. Wow. So of course they didn't remember. But then he saw like, wow, it's amazing. So and he was so happy that I was at the wedding. You get it? So from both sides, the Chas was happy, the Kalas family was happy, Hashem was happy, and that was wonderful and great. So there you see, you go and you do a good thing, and boom, boom, things pop in. And when I was in Chicago, I'm not going to give you a whole Chicago story, but I'll tell you one thing. So I dive in Mincha in Skokie, my brother's Chabad house, right? And I'm there, and some guy says, you know, <laughs> Russian guy, he says, you know, I was in your Chabad house, 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I look at him, I don't remember at all. What, you know? And he has a whole thing about he came and it was cold, it was winter, his car was broke, broke down or something, I had to take him to the mechanic. A whole nicer, unbelievable. Okay, that was another Ashgacha protest. Here goes, and this is the final Ashgacha protest story I'm going to tell you now, and then we're going to talk about, uh, we're forbearing about other things. Thursday night, I think it was 9 o'clock, Right, I had just come back that day from Chicago, sitting in the house, and the doorbell rings. Now, in our updated security system, we have a camera. I can see the guy, and I don't recognize him, but he has a black hat and a beard. So I'm figuring this can't be too dangerous, but Kanye would be very upset, and she's right, to just ring the doorbell. Well, you don't know who the guy is. You don't do that. So I go running down the stairs, and I come to open the door, open the door, right? I see the guy, very able Jewish guy. Bring, bring him in. We sit down to talk. He says, I came here to express my hakaris hataif, my gratitude. Okay, then goes the, the life story. Life story is he grew up in California. His parents that were traditional, the little Shabbos, little kosher, not very firm, but you know, traditional. And then he says, he was 15 years old. He's very interested in math. So he came to BU for the summer program, that a summer program for high school kids. He was 15. At that point, he was going to, to uh, public school, but he really wanted to, you know, he was actually get more into his Yiddish kind. He said, I came to this Chabad house every Shabbos that summer. And when we came home, my parents had moved from one town to another town in California. And the public school that was in that town was very not good. Kids weren't good kids. So he said to his father, I want to go to yeshiva. Went to yeshiva. That, um, long story short, he now lives in Israel with his Kanainahar, I believe, eight children. And, yeah. And he said, I want to come and thank you because of an impact that summer had in, it was how many years ago was it? It was like, what is it, 20, 35 years? No, not 35. I think it was 2000, 19, 1989. 1989, how many years is that? That's like 35 that's years 30, ago. That's 35 years. Ouch. 35 years. And he came and he, and he took the train from the Boston, the Rebbe's, where he's staying there, because he was flying mm -hmm. back to Israel. Came, took a train. It was cold. And he came to say thank you. And now, you know, it's amazing. So you never know when you do something, do a mitzvah, you help another Jew, you never know what's going to happen later on, the implications of it. This is all a gift from Hashem, and it's a gift that the Rebbe encouraged us to reach out to other Jews and to do, and open up Chabad houses like we have. So this message is from my friend Michael. He's a junior, a senior, I forgot what he, I think he's a senior. He's doing his last semester in, in Sydney, Australia. And so, I, and he was supposed to go with another guy. The other guy didn't go with him. So he's like, he's there alone. He's not alone. There's other video students there. I said, what, where's the other Jew? So he's going to go to the Chabad house there. And he said, you know, maybe I'll ask the other Jewish students to come with me. I said, of course, that's what you're there for. You're the shliach of BU in Sydney for this semester. That's how you have to look at it. So the Rebbe teaches us a, a teaching like this. Listen to this. It says that when there was darkness in Mitzrayim, it says in the dwellings of the Jews, there was light. So one of the things about the light was that the Jews were able to go during the plague of darkness, go into the homes of the Egyptians and see where the gold and silver is. And then before they left Mitzrayim, Hashem told Moshe to tell the Jewish people to borrow the gold and silver from the Egyptians and take it out of Egypt. And the idea, according to Chassidus, is 
that they took the gold and silver from the Egyptians, and eventually they were going to use it to build the Mishkan, which is what we do. Why we're in exile is to take the material stuff of exile and use it for holy purposes. Yeah. So, but every person has their place in the world. This is very important because you just moved to Detroit, Darton. That's not a random thing. It's like the, just like the Jews took 42 stops in the desert from Egypt until Israel. Every Jew has 42 stops. I don't know exactly how that works, but but wherever you are, that's because that's your mission in life. Your neshama has to take care, has to elevate that place. So when you're sitting in that apartment in Detroit and you put a mezuzah on the door, you make kiddush on Friday night, you're elevating the place. That's that's part of the the um, mission of your neshama in this world is to make make that place holy. And if you make Shabbos, you invite a Jewish friend or two or three or four. That's how you make the place holy. So the Jews are in Egypt. Now, each one of them has to find what is his mission to elevate. And so Hashem, and they don't know, they're just going to random Egyptians. That's the light. The light is the miracle that Hashem guides each person, each Jew, to the place that they have to be to be able to elevate that physical stuff. And so that's why when a person finds themselves in a place, like famously, when Jonathan Sachs, a blessed memory, went to the Rebbe the first time at a college student, he tells a story about, he was going around then to great leaders of Jews and wanted to find out the direction of life. He came to the Rebbe and he asked the Rebbe some questions. He says, then one thing happened, never happened before to me. The Rebbe asked me questions. And the Rebbe said to me, and what are you doing for the Jews in Cambridge College? I think that was cool. And he said, well, in the circumstances that I find myself, and the Rebbe says, that person doesn't find themselves in these circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's uh, yeah, you don't find yourself there. You're there. You're meant to be there. Well, let me tell you, back to the story of putting on this film, the guy in the GSU. So what happened was, as, as we're putting on this film, another guy walks by, and he looked a little bit like South American, and he just gave a little smile and kept on going. When I went outside to go back to my car to do the next stop I had to go to, so this guy sees me, he says, ah, oh, Shalom. I said, oh, are you Jewish too? He says, no, I'm not Jewish, I'm from Brooklyn. Uh. And he says to me, I'm going to mention something here and say, let's keep this under control. He says, oh, they're building tunnels in 770. So I'm from Eastern Parkway. I'm like, here's this random Gentile. <laughs> I tell him, nah, it's not a big deal. It's just, it's, it's really not a big deal. It's not an issue. The internet made a big thing out of me. He said, I know, I know. My sister works for the fire department in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> and she See, came there and she told me it's not a big deal. <laughs> it's so, so anyway. funny because when, when we first heard about the tunnels, you know, we were talking about this before they became like a, a big story, right? And so I said we should talk about them on the podcast because at the time when we first heard about them, the impression that I was getting was the Bachram dug under to try to get in during COVID. Right. But right. then the story comes out that it's, you know, the whole dispute or whatever, right? And so yeah, it's... Yeah, I, I, I still think, I don't know, and I don't care. We're not going to talk about it more for another 10 seconds. But I think this whole thing, it, it was it was a COVID thing, and then they changed the story. I don't know the whole story. It doesn't matter. It's not Either way, thing. it's a massive Chilol Hashem. Massive. Oh, man. So let's, keep, let's not talk about it more. Let me waste more time about it. But anyway, but I just laughed it off with this guy, and he was laughing too. He's oh, my sister's in the fire department. <laughs> Yeah, so Chil is something we can mention in brief, and that is that, you know, we have to know that we are the, the emissaries of this to this world to present Hashem. That's what a Jew is. And therefore, we have to be careful what we do, what we say, and how we behave, absolutely. And that means being polite to other people. I work very hard on that. <laughs> you see for somebody, you're nice to them. It, you know what it means? And, and, and when the guy came over to me and he said, you're a rabbi, I was like, yeah, I'm a rabbi. He said, you don't see, he says, we don't see too many of them around here. <laughs> <laughs> so when I drive, Khani always tells me, don't cut anybody off because they'll see you. They see your rabbi. So, oh man. So I, sometimes I will be driving it and I'll stop deliberately, let somebody in. I'll say, that's my mitzvah, my, my kiddush Hashem for the day. <laughs> anyway, so this Shabbos, we move on. This Shabbos is Yud Shvat. I told somebody I wanted to see him. He said, I'm going to come for Shabbos. I said, it's a very special Shabbos. He said, what's so special? Yud Shvat. 
Yud Shvat is the anniversary of the passing of the pre previous Rebbe in 1950, and the official ascension to the leadership of Chabad in 1951 of our Rebbe. And um, so this is a very, a very powerful Shabbos. It's a, a Shabbos of, of recognition and thanksgiving. We have to be thankful to Hashem for giving us leaders like the Rebbe. And that's not enough. We also have to learn from the Rebbe and from the pre previous Rebbe. So let's talk a little bit about the previous Rebbe. So I was listening this morning to a talk of the Rebbe. We talked about the three tkufas, the three different time periods in the previous Rebbe's life. From 19... 20 to 1930, 1930, 1940, 1994, 1950. 1920 was when the Rebbe became Rebbe in Soviet Union, in the USSR, which then was under Stalin, Yamach So it was a very difficult time, very challenging time. And in 1927, the Friedrich Rebbe was arrested, and in 1928 had to leave Russia. But the Rebbe calls that the 10 years of Mesiras Nefesh, of self-sacrifice. Because even when he left Russia, and then he moved, eventually he moved to Poland, but in that he was in Latvia, it was a temporary thing. So he didn't find, his permanent place was not till 1930 when he moved, moved to Poland, to Warsaw. And so until that time, it's all part of that Mesiras Nefesh era, which basically means that his life was on the line. And, you know, the last Fabrengen that the Rebbe gave before he was arrested on Purim Katan, which we have this year is, an, is also a leap year. So you have two Purim cut in the first Adar and then a regular Purim in the second Adar. And he said, we can't be afraid of what's the, of the of the enemy around us. And he inspired people to be be proud and and, and but it was it was a big challenge. It was a, it was a life life threatening environment he was in. The second ten years was a time that he was amongst other Jews with great opportunities to spread Judaism. But then there was some kind of not positive feelings with some of the Jews that were there. And that he, the Rebbe calls that at the time of Ayakana Boy Echav, which is an allusion to the first Yosef in the Torah, because the previous Rebbe's name was Yosef Yitzchak. The first Yosef in the Torah was Yosef, the, one of the brothers. And he had the dreams, so it says his brothers were jealous, and his father waited to see how it can get fulfilled. So Ayakana Boy Echav, his brothers were jealous of him. That was, that was the challenge there. And finally, he came to America with the challenge of, when he came off the boat, the Friedrich Rebbe said, America is not Andersh. America is not different. We're going to make America into a place of Torah and Yiddishkeit, where Jews can be proud, where Jews can wear a beard in the street. That's one of the things that in that time was unusual. Even you see some of the very observant Jews, but a beard was like too much. So many, but the point was that America was a, a place to transform, a place of lack of a lot of expressed Jewish holiness and make it holy. And of course, in 1951, the Rebbe took over that position. And the Rebbe said in his first teaching, two things in the first teaching that the Rebbe said. One of them was he talked about Havas Yisrael, caring about another Jew. And in fact, he said that every one of the previous Rebbe's has a unique story about that expressed Havas Yisrael and told that those, the, each, a, little, a little anecdote from each one of them. That's Av Yisrael. And then Av Yisrael comes with Av Hashem and Av Satur. Love God, love the Torah, love the Jews. Love the Jews, bring close to, to God. I bring Jews close to Torah, God with Torah. And that was the Rebbe's mission. The Rebbe said that our generation will be the generation that brings Mashiach. So this is, and this actually starts with the Baal Shem Tov. The Baal Shem Tov said once had a, an elevation of soul to the abode in, in heaven of Mashiach. And he said to Mashiach, when are you coming? Mashiach said, when the wellsprings of your teachings of Chassidut will be spread out to the rest of the world. Spreading the wellsprings, that's the mission. And so when the Rebbe said that, it wasn't like, oh wow, there's some new thing, we never heard this before. No, this is the mission of Lubavitch Chabad the whole time. And so we, ha so we have the responsibility because we have the privilege to have all the wisdom of the Rebbe imparted to us. And that's, that's the gift that we have. Then the responsibility is we have to live up to it and use that. And these are the things that we talk about every week, are the things that the Rebbe taught us. The idea of Ashgach Prat is not a new idea, but the Rebbe emphasized it so much, so many times. Everything by divine power, everything by divine providence. Always look for, for the message from Hashem in any situation you are. Many Fabrengans, the Rebbe would talk about something that happened recently in current events. And they said, what can we learn from this? What can we learn from this? And each time there was a pertinent lesson in how we serve Hashem. In fact, if you look at Chabad Arog, you can see that my, they did an interview with my father a number of years ago, 
And he, there he talks about he talks about what you can learn from chess. And the Rebbe told it by Fabrenian. He was a chess champion that lived in, in um, Crown Heights. And he came to Fabrenian. So the Rebbe talked about what can, you learn from, what can you learn from chess. What was the lesson from chess? We should have talked about this before December 25th. The lesson from chess is that you have two types of pieces. You have officers and you have regular soldiers. You have the, like the, the, the king, the queen, the, the, the rook, the bishop, the horses, and then you have the pawns. So you have, and he says, the officers are like malachim. They can jump. Like, they don't have to go one space at a time. Like, you know, like, each one of them can jump many spaces at a time. The pawn can only go one step at a time. That's the souls of the Jews. So the malachim jump, and they go from level to level. But the one thing is, they can never change who they are. A horse is a horse. A castle is a castle. They can't change. The pawn can change. How? If you go, if you progress all the way to the other end, you reach the highest level. To what level? Even to the level of the queen. But one thing you can't become is the king. Why? Because the king is Hashem, the only one Hashem, Hashem Echad. So a Jew is able to progress higher and higher. He's not stuck in, like angels, Al Trevor talks about in Tanya, that angels are, are stuck where they are. Like this Malach Machol is the angel of kindness. There's no severity in his in his reality. Malach Avril is judgment. Each one has their mission. They're very holy. No, no question about that. They're expressions of godliness. But they can't change anything. It's only the Jew in this world can make a difference, make a change. And then, and that's the whole point. We have to understand that all of the spiritual worlds that exist exist so that we can exist. It's a, it's the you know it's the downward coming of all the holiness seeps down into, into our world so we can exist. But the only reason they exist to begin with is so we can do the mitzvahs. So the malachim are standing, the angels and the souls in heaven are saying, come on, guys, do a mitzvah, do a mitzvah. Because then God is, erupts and is revealed in all the in all the whole order of creation, including in, the, in their level as well. So they're waiting for us to do mitzvahs. And this is the message of that first teaching that the previous gave away. Also, that's part of the message here, which by divine providence, he gave out this t- a teaching before he passed away, and it talks there about what's the purpose of human be- uh, of a Jew in this world, a human being, a Jew in this world. And that's the point that it makes there, is to, to guide every... See, people think, oh man, Judaism is so heavy, there's so much to do. you got to flip it around. There's so many opportunities. Wherever you go is an opportunity. You go, you take a break at work, and you go to the water fountain, like every office has a water fountain. Right? You take a drink of water, you say a bracha, shakal miya bedvari. You like, you literally express that God is the master universe right there at the water cooler. Amazing. That's an opportunity. It's not like a burden. And so these are, you know, like it says when, when Hashem, there's a medrash, I think. Hashem created all the animals. Then he created the birds. The birds were very small. And the bird had wings. And the bird said, Hashem, there's all these big animals and I'm so small and you dump these wings on top of me. It makes my life so much harder, especially if there's animals of prey, I'll be in trouble. Hashem said, you foolish little bird, with those wings, you flap them, you rise above everybody. Mitzvahs are, are the wings that Hashem gave us. Every, we're not below the world or contained by the world. We do mitzvahs, we fly above, fly up ahead, on top. And we have that, and we don't have to worry about anything. So this is the message for for um, for Yudshvat. and we're going to conclude this Fabrengen with the recording from the Rebbe interacting with people. I want to just give a little introduction. Frank Lautenberg was a U.S. senator, and the Rebbe spoke to him for many hours. This is a yechidus that, uh, that happened late, late at night, and went on for a number of hours. This is at the end of the whole thing. The Rebbe says what you're going to see here. And I think the end of that, the conclusion that was, Deborah said to him, I don't think it's on this recording, if Frank Lautenberg will put on fill in tomorrow, then our meeting was successful. Okay, let's play it. Oh, don't hear the sound. Do you not hear it? I didn't hear it. Okay, let me try that again.
stand by as we try and give it another try. This is also excellent podcasting for anyone who doesn't speak. To share audio, share a tab instead. <gasps> Wait, what? Okay, hang on. Um... Okay, if we don't have the sound, then we'll have to do it without the sound. And you can always, I, I, get, I get a daily um, snippet of Rebbe talk on a WhatsApp group from Jem. And this was it today. Here we go. Okay, so it says, if you are telling me that I have some qualities of doing something, uh, yeah. then you will look tomorrow morning in the mirror. If you will see the same Lautenberg from yesterday, that means that I have achieved nothing. You have achieved plenty is what the response is. That depends on you is what the, the Rebbe says. And that you should continue That's to be the leader of your people. That depends on you if you allow me to lead, says the Rebbe. Oh, yes, very much, says the response. Blessing and success, says the Rebbe. May you continue to lead the Jewish community with the great success that you've had. The Rebbe says to grow, not only to live. And he says to live and to grow. So there's basically the Rebbe's message. If it doesn't bring into action, if you don't allow me to lead, I can only lead if you allow me. So the Rebbe is the Rebbe in a sense if we allow him to be the Rebbe. And I, I, I think I quoted this once, but again, Elie Wiesel said, a blessed memory, in one of his lectures about Hasidism, he says, the Rebbe doesn't choose the Hasidim, the Hasidim choose the Rebbe. So when we, we, in a sense, it's like a king. You have to appoint the king. We're not talking about a, about a, a tyrant, a dictator. We're talking about a king. The people accept the kings as, as their master. When we accept the king as a master, then the king can express their mastership. So when we accept the Rebbe as our teacher and our leader of our generation, then he is able to affect what he has to affect in the upper worlds and also in the lower worlds. And ultimately, everybody will do what they have to do. We in this world and all the holy souls in the world of souls will do their thing, and together we'll bring Mashiach to this world speedily, mamish, now. Amen. And with that, thank you so much for listening to episode 39 of the Postcast with Rabbi Shmuel Posner. We will see you next week. Beard Hashem.